Can I begin? Yeah. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to the seminar. Let me quickly remind you of the format here. There'll be two talks, um, 20 minutes each with 10 minutes for questions uh, afterwards. Um, if you have a question during the talk, the uh, standard way to do it is to type the word question in capitals, like I just did, into the chat box. Uh, and then we'll make sure later, when the talk is over, to go through those and make sure your question gets addressed. Um, we'll ask you to mute your mic uh, during the talk. And in between the two presentations, there'll be a 10-minute coffee break in which you're invited. You're welcome to join a breakout room or, or not, as you prefer. And you'd be, you'd be joined with a random selection of three to five other people uh, in order to chat. Uh, our first presentation today is by Jörg Rotha. And he's speaking on what's new in altruistic hedonic games. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone in the US, and good afternoon, everyone in Europe, and so on. So now my talk will be about uh, altruistic hedonic games and what's new in, in them. Uh, so this is about game theory. And let me go back uh, to the history of game theory a little. So in the beginnings, uh, starting with the work of von Neumann and Morgenstern, uh, in game theory, we were looking at uh, uh, players that, that are like the homo economists. Eco uh, so, and they could look like this. So they are really uh, relentlessly aiming to, uh, for their own advantage and were trying to get as much as, as they could uh, in terms of their own gains, no matter what consequences that had uh, for the other players. Uh, and so this is uh, in spirit somehow related to Darwin's thesis of survival of the fittest, uh, in this case, uh, this uh, aggressive chimpanzee. Maybe the fittest and uh, survival in biological terms uh, is equated with uh, having the, uh, uh, the, the best reproduction rate. Now, uh, this thesis of Darwin's has been countered recently by two biologists uh, who, who claim that uh, or who make a case for the survival of the friendliest. And they have a lot of interesting examples, uh, for example, concerning bonobos, which are very closely related to chimpanzees, uh, but have a much friendlier behavior. And perhaps a bit surprisingly, these bonobos have more uh, progenies than chimpanzees. So the most successful bonobo is more successful than the most successful chimpanzee. And in that sense, uh, uh, also our species uh, of humans benefited uh, from friendly behavior in the past because it allowed us, uh, that is uh, what Hare and Woods claim in their book, uh, uh, to form larger groups and to be more social. And uh, that, that is why we could even so form societies. Now, I will talk about altruistic behavior in game theory, because game theory can be used to model, for example, interaction of software agents uh, in uh, artificial intelligence, and it's a very interesting field. Here's a quick overview over my talk. I will, after giving a short introduction to Hedonic Games, uh, will say a little bit about these four papers. Uh, starting with the one by Nguyen et al. Uh, from four years ago at Amas, uh, where we introduced the notion of altruistic hedonic games. And there are uh, other interesting work, for example, by Jacob Schlüter and Judy Goldsmith uh, about what they called super altruistic hedonic games. However, I will not talk about their paper here. I hope that maybe Judy sometime will talk in this seminar about super altruistic hedonic games. 
what I will be talking most about today is uh, my recent paper with my student Alessandra Wichers, uh, who also did most of the slides in that part of the talk. Uh, and she presented that at STAIRS this year. And this is about a variant of altruistic hedonic games, uh, which is called minimum or minimization based altruistic hedonic games. And uh, in the end, I will, before I abruptly end my talk, I will talk uh, very quickly, very briefly about uh, recent work with my PhD student, uh, Anna Kerkmann, uh, about a paper that uh, she will, uh, or we will present at HK uh, this year or actually next year, because HK has been shifted to January. So now uh, let's start with uh, hedonic games. We have a group of players and we want to subdivide them into smaller groups, which are called coalitions. And this might look like this. And uh, in, uh, this, this gives us a coalition structure. Every player has weak preferences about uh, all the coalitions uh, that contain himself, him or herself. And uh, players do not care about collisions they are not part of. The goal is to make a stable collision structure. That means to partition uh, these players into groups uh, in a way that makes every player as happy as possible and uh, measured uh, there are lots of measures for this mutual agreement uh, about coalition or about happiness. Uh, uh, these are called stability notions and I will introduce some of them later in the talk. Now, um, as, as you can see here, if every player has a preference uh, over all coalitions containing him, this is an exponential number in the number of players. And therefore we need some compact way to represent such games. One, there, there are, there's uh, lots of uh, literature about that. One way is to use the friend-oriented uh, uh, preference relation. Uh, introduced by Dimitrov et al. You see the paper down here. And uh, in, in their model, we uh, first specify a network of friends, which is just a graph where we uh, express the friendship relation by these edges among players. So each player subdivides uh, all the other players into friends and enemies. If there's uh, an edge to another player, they are friends. And if there's no edge, like these two players, uh, they are enemies. And now uh, we can define uh, the friend-oriented preferences. So uh, if two coalitions contain the same number of players, then, uh, um, no, uh, so uh, if, if a player wants to compare two coalitions, he first looks at uh, uh, or counts the number of friends in both. And if this number is equal, then uh, he, he chooses the coalition uh, as the preferred one with fewer enemies. Uh, so now, let us look at an example that can motivate altruism in, in such games. So look at uh, the player on the right side here. So in these two coalitions, uh, so the, the, the coalitions uh, are very similar. The only difference is that the two friends of that player have uh, a friendship relation themselves in that coalition and they don't have one in this, so here they are enemies. Now by the friend oriented uh, preferences, both coalitions would be the same for this. Sorry. Uh, bo both coalitions would be the same for this player. But uh, of course, uh, this player might be 
find might find this coalition better because uh, the, the two other players in that coalition are friends with each other. And so there's more harmony among them. And uh, that is why this one might be better. Now, uh, altruistic hedonic games have been introduced by Nguyen et al. And they start with the friend-oriented uh, notion of preference, which can also be defined in this way where we uh, look at the number of friends in, in the coalition of, of some player I, and uh, we give that number a larger weight. We multiply it with the number N of players, and then we subtract the number of enemies in that coalition, and this gives the utility of a coalition in, uh, according to the friend-oriented uh, preference. And then we can compare two coalitions A and B according to the following three degrees of altruism. In the first one, uh, called selfish first preferences, the player first looks uh, at his own, his or her own uh, friend-oriented preferences regarding A and B. And only if this player is indifferent between A and B, he looks at the preferences of uh, his or her friends in that coalition, and then takes the average uh, and uh, uses that to make the decision which of the two coalitions is preferred. The next decree is called equal treatment preferences. Here a player treats her own and her friends' utilities equally when taking the average in both coalitions. And the last decree is called altruistic treatment preferences, where player I looks first at her friends' average utilities. And only if they are indifferent on average between A and B, then I would look at her own uh, friend-oriented uh, utility for A and B to make the decision. Now, in the paper with Ale Alessandra Wichers uh, that uh, was presented at STAIRS, we took the same approach and defined three degrees of minimization uh, uh, of altruism, but this time uh, these decrees are based on the minimum rather than the average. So in minimum selfish first, uh, our player looks first at his or her own friend-oriented preferences. And, uh, and only if this player is indifferent between the two coalitions, uh, it would look at the friend-oriented preferences of the unhappiest friend uh, in that coalition. Minimum equal treatment means we take the minimum of one's own and so, uh, uh, so that, that was about minimum Selfish first, we first look at our own and then at our, our at the unhappiest friend in that coalition. So you can see here that this player is unhappier than the other friends of this player uh, because it has fewer friends in that coalition. In minimum equal treatment, uh, we take the minimum of uh, one's own and the unhappiest friends friend-oriented preferences. And for minimum altruistic treatment, we first consider our friends, our, uh, uh, our unhappiest friend in that coalition, and then our own uh, preferences. Now, uh, let us uh, look at some of the results. So we have looked at various stability concepts, for example, Nash stability, which informally speaking means that nobody wants to switch to another coalition in a given coalition structure. And we can show that under all three degrees of minimization based algorithm, such a coalition structure always exists. So this is sort of a trivial problem. And that is the same result as in the original case uh, of Nguyen et al. 
And the idea is quite simple. First, uh, we uh, look at all the players who don't have any friends and we leave them alone in, in their single coalitions, in their singleton coalitions. And then we take all the other players into one big coalition. All players are contained there who have at least one friend. And this uh, coalition structure is Nash, Nash stable under all three degrees of minimization based algorithm. Core stability is a notion uh, that uh, means that uh, we uh, have uh, a group of people who want, uh, so we, we want to prevent that a group of people wants to go, uh, wants to form a coalition of their own. And uh, here we can show that under minimum selfish first preferences, such a coalition structure always exists. And the idea is uh, that we simply take uh, a look at all the connected components of the graph of, uh, of the network of friends. And then uh, we have these, uh, uh, this uh, coalition structure that is more stable. For the other two preferences, uh, this is still open. Another uh, stability concept is called strict popularity. And uh, this is interesting because uh, it connects uh, um, cooperative game theory with, with voting theory in a way. So here we want to compare uh, coalition structures, two coalition structures, by sort of taking a vote among all the uh, players. For example, if you look uh, at these two coalition structures, then uh, the player, uh, this player, uh, would prefer the right coalition structure because uh, it has more friends here. Uh, this player would prefer the left coalition structure for the same reason. And the middle player would uh, be 50-50, would be indifferent between the two uh, structures because uh, they look like the same to this player. Uh, now we can compare uh, this number of uh, uh, votes. And uh, if a coalition structure wins against every other coalition structure, in direct comparison, then it would be strictly popular. Here we can show that under all three degrees of minimization based algorithm, verifying whether a given coalition structure is strictly popular is going P complete. The corresponding existence problems are uh, going P hard, at least. We don't uh, know if the complexity is perhaps higher. Uh, but here we have more results than in the uh, original uh, notion due to Nguyen et al. because they could show this completeness result only for selfish first preferences. Uh, finally, in that paper, we have looked at uh, the most preferred coalition. We couldn't really solve uh, this uh, problem. Uh, so this is a problem where we are given uh, a hedonic game and a coalition and a player. And we want to know if that co coalition is the most preferred coalition of that player. This problem is in Cohen P. We don't know if it's Cohen P hard or complete. We would guess so. But we know that uh, this, uh, the difficulty of solving that depends on the number of enemies uh, of the uh, unhappiest friend of the given player, because uh, we can show that the number of friends of the unhappiest friend of the given player is uh, computable in polynomial time. The number of enemies uh, might be harder to compute. So here are some open problems uh, for uh, minimization-based altruistic hedonic games. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, the question is uh, whether there are 
always cause stable collision structures in minimization, equal treatment or minimization uh, altruistic treatment cases for selfish uh, first minimization or minimum selfish first uh, preferences, we know it is the case. But for the other two preferences, we don't know that. If it's not the case, then it would be interesting to look at the complexity of the corresponding existence and verification problems. And otherwise, we would look at uh, uh, we, we would look uh, at the conditions under which uh, perhaps such collision structures always exist. Well, they don't exist always, but uh, we, we would be interested in when they exist. And uh, as I said, uh, for the most preferred uh, coalition, it would be nice to find an algorithm or to show the hardness of uh, this problem. Now, for uh, I'm not sure how much time I still have. I guess two minutes or so. Uh, yeah, so for the last yes, topic, two minutes, Jörg. Okay, thanks. For the last uh, uh, topic in that talk, uh, I will just give a motivating example and nothing else. So here is the steering committee of that seminar, and you might have guessed that they are all friends with each other and form a clique, but the truth is that is not the case. Uh, Dominic, sorry, you seem to be enemies with everyone here, and that's just because elderly people like to stick together. Uh, but they are also not friends uh, uh, with each other. So we, we have a chain of, of friends here. Bill with Edith, Edith with Ulle, Ulle with Raison, and nothing else. Now, if we look at these two coalition structures. Then we see that under friend-oriented preferences, Bill is indifferent between this coalition and that because both contain one of his friends, Edith, and one of his enemies, here Ole and here Vincent. And that's why he is indifferent between the, these two coalition structures. Under altruistic hedonic preferences uh, of Nguyen et al., Bill would care for his friend Edith, being friends with Ulle but not with Vincent, and so would prefer that one. Now suppose that Bill is falling out with Edith. He still is friends with her, uh, so the network of friends remains unchanged, and yet he, he wants to be alone for a while. Maybe Edith prefers to write a paper with Ulle and not with him, or I don't know what the reason was, but anyway, uh, he wants to be alone now, and so these two collision structures are changed in, in that way. Now, if we look at uh, Adonic games, uh, and ask ourselves if Bill should still behave altruistically towards his friend Edith, then in hedonic games, the, the answer is no, because under any hedonic preferences, Bill must disregard these two prefer uh, uh, collisions because they don't contain him anymore. And so under hedonic preferences, he must be indifferent between these two coalition structures Anna and I believe that uh, we therefore have to study altruism more generally in coalition formation games, and we did so, and we will present our results about that at HKI, the next one. So this is the very abrupt end of my talk. I had to prepare the slides. Uh, today until a few minutes before the talk started and I didn't have time to have a thank you, uh, to make a thank you slide. That's it. Thank you, Jörg. Uh, let's everyone unmute and give Jörg a, a round of applause. We have, we have several questions uh, uh, in the chat. The first one is from Erel Siegel-Halevi. Erel, would you like to uh, speak up? 
Uh, yes, so I'm, as a teacher, I'm, I'm especially interested in how do I use these results for helping my students group into teams for homework. So I was wondering uh, what, uh, what, what uh, uh, of, of these utilities functions, the minimum and the average, you, you get six options all in all, which of them is more realistic, particularly in the case of students? Do you have an idea? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, I actually cannot answer it because uh, you would have to do psychological experiments with your students first uh, to, to find out what uh, what is more realistic here. Uh, I, I mean, the, the difference between minim minimization-based algorithm and algorithm is simply that, uh, uh, so, or is similar to the difference between utilitarian welfare and egalitarian welfare. Mm. So uh, we have more information in, in the average case, and, uh, but, but we care more for, for the student who is worst off in, in the minimization-based case and ignore all the other preferences. So it sort of depends on what you want. Okay. Errol, have you asked your, your students whether they prefer being in groups with friends or prefer being in groups with people who are good at solving problems? Because if, uh, it's, okay. if it's the latter, then there's going to be some commonality of preferences. And it, seem, mm -hmm. it seems to me there are results in hedonic games that suggest that when people's preferences tend to be more similar, stability chances are enhanced. Uh, thank you. This is very interesting. I, I, I believe they prefer to be with friends, but this is only anecdotal. I didn't uh, research, but it's a very good, uh, very good question. Thanks. Uh, the next question is from Sekhan Ozbilan. Sekhan, would you like to speak up? And I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, in 2003, uh, Brian and Zwicker published in their paper that Designing separable preferences is sufficient for core stability and niche stability. And in 2006 and 2007, Dimitrov and Sang published two results. Uh, it is about top responsiveness and symmetry. Uh, they stated that top responsiveness is uh, sufficient for the existence of strictly core stable coalition structures. And in the next paper, they stated that top responsiveness and symmetry is sufficient for the existence of niche stability. Uh, your domain condition is directly imposed on individual preferences. So I just want to ask, have you checked the relation between your domain condition and these conditions in the uh, previous years? Is there any uh -huh. relation between them? Any one of them imply each other? Uh we, we have not checked this, uh, and I didn't quite understand which paper, so I, I understood uh, Dimitrov is an author. Dimitrov and Sang in 2006 and 2007, and yeah. Burani and Zivikar in 2003. Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I think I know these papers, uh, but, but we, we would have to check the, the domain conditions and see if, if we can take something out of that. Good idea, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yannick Peters has a question. Yannick, would you like to speak up? I was wondering if there's any relation between popularity and your stability notions, just like there are in stable matchings. Uh, we don't have any relationships uh, found so far, I, I would say. Uh, it, of course, it. Uh, uh, it, I, I think one should look into this. Thanks. Uh, Edith has a question. Dominic has an unknown serious question. Edith has a serious question. I have a somewhat more serious question. Right, so concerning this last friendship setting, right, so you say that kind of preferences may be non-hedonic in that player may care about kind of what happens in other coalitions. I've been just wondering, which solution concepts does it matter for? Because for things like, things like core stability or Nash stability, what does it matter if you have some preference over, over what other players do? It doesn't affect your behavior. 
uh, I mean, we, we, we have in our paper, we have some examples where we show that uh, the two concepts are different. So that uh, uh, collisions that are preferred in one uh, preference uh, relation are not in the other. And, and then we, we just go to, uh, through all these results. And in some cases, we, we can show similar results, but by modif modified proofs. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, are, are you asking here about uh, uh, the results or about the motivation? Of the model. Right, I'm, asking, I'm asking about which solution concepts kind of change when you modify this. Okay, yes, yeah, so there's an yeah. answer from Dominic in the chat that you may want to deviate the collision to save your friend from being lonely. Okay, yeah, I accept that, right? So you wouldn't leave a collision, but you may join a collision. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Popularity would be another one. So do you consider these notions with popularity? I didn't understand the, the question. Right. Okay, so we take it offline. Okay. You can communicate later. Let's see, Judy had a question. Judy? That was actually a comment about students not being hedonic in their preferences. Ah. So Judy's point is that if students are competitive, that their preferences might not be hedonic. They want other students to do poorly, so they do relatively well. Is that it, Judy? The microphone is yes. Oh. Okay, so... Um, Errol has a comment um, that there's apparently a great room for empirical research regarding preferences in various domains. Of course, eliciting such preferences might be difficult. Ah, Hervé has a question. Yes, unmute yourself, Hervé. Yeah, just coming back to your introduction and the evolutionary uh, motivation, are you able to show that more and more friendly oriented preferences increase stability. I did not get that sense very clearly from the talk, but of course I'm not familiar with the, the set of results. So is there such a, such a trend that can be um, uh, identified from, from more and more friendliness uh, enhances stability? Uh... I, I wouldn't say so. So, uh, so it's, this is sort of related to the question with the most preferred coalition. So uh, having more and more friends uh, is not, not only uh, good in, in that case, because uh, the, the happiness also depends on how unhappy perhaps friends of these friends would be. And uh, so we, we have uh, a distance. In that uh, sense, uh, Judy's notion of super altruistic hedonic games are interesting uh, be, because they they look at friends farther away. And okay. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Jörg, Jörg, you had one result I forget which that said the uh, th that led to a, a stable coalition structure consisting of some singletons and a large group, all of whom were together. That certainly seems to be a circumstance under which you could say that um, uh, stability was enhanced because that seems like about as stable as you can hope for. In a yes, I agree, yes. Okay, are there other questions? Okay, let's unmute and thank um, Jörg one more time. Now, Dominic will invite us into uh, breakout rooms. You're welcome to do that for the next 10 minutes or to not do that and do something else instead. And we'll see you in a few minutes.
Shall we begin, Dominic? Yeah. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, the second talk today will be presented by Lirong Jha of RPI, The Smooth Possibility of Social Choice. Thank you, Veer, and thanks um, for the uh, organizers. It's really my great pleasure to be able to share with you some recent works that uh, excited myself very much. And um, I'm too excited that I'm going to speak too fast, so um, probably um, I mean, you can play the back uh, with a uh, half a speed, maybe that works better. So um, it's gonna be based on two papers. One is, uh, it's gonna be uh, presented in Europe, and the other one is a walking paper, and you can download it from uh, the seminar website. So it is being constantly updating uh, all the time. <laughs> so hopefully it will be published at some point. Okay, so um, we all know that there are many impossibility theorems or paradoxes in social choice, maybe too many of them. And actually, um, if you take a closer look, many of them are based on worst case analysis. So what do I mean by that? So let's look at perhaps the earliest and most famous paradox, Condorcet's paradox, for example. One way to describe Condorcet's paradox is to say, pairwise majority is not always you know, transitive. It means that there's a possibility, a possibility to make it uh, transitive. And the proof is by just looking at the worst case scenario. Say, here is the preference profile among three candidates, three voters. And if you look at this as a classical Condorcet cycle, you see it's not transitive. Okay, so you just need to show one example, then the paradox uh, is proved. Let's look at another um, impossibility results or um, impossibility phenomenon, which um, is called uh, NNR impossibility, which is a pretty um, um, basic thing, a fundamental thing, which says that no voting rule satisfies anonymity. Here's where it comes from neutrality and resolvability. And the limit says that um, the voting rule does not depend on the, um, the identity of voters. Neutrality says that voting rule does not depend on the identity of the candidates. And resolvability basically just says that the voting rule always output a single winner, but not a set of co-winners, okay? Um, and the proof actually, so just in this version, the proof can be very easily done by giving an very uh, simple worst case analysis. Say, we're gonna look at two candidates and two voters, and their votes look like this, one prefers two, two prefers one. And without lots of generality, let's say the winner is one, um, it's unique. And then if you're gonna apply the, um, the, the switching the um, positions of what candidate one and two, you've got another profile and by neutrality, the winner should be two, but by anonymity, it still looks the same as the previous one, so the winner should still be one, but this is a contradiction because you cannot choose a different winners from the same profile. Actually, uh, there is a very elegant uh, characterization by Roland. I think it was first seen it in uh, 83, but uh, 91 book is probably a better reference, which is really surprising I, uh, when, I, when I knew it. So it basically characterized all of the combinations of alternatives and agents for ANR to hold. So let's say M is the number of alternatives, N is the number of agents. This ANR impossibility holds if and only if uh, M can be represented by uh, the, as the sum of N's non-trivial divisors. Non-trivial means that's strictly larger than one. So in other words, if this condition is not satisfied, there exists a resolute voting rule that is both anonymous and uh, neutral. And of course, you can name your favorite help uh, as uh, uh, impossibility theorems like arrows, given that wise, and many, many, many more. So, I mean, there are too many impossibility theorems, so what am I gonna do with it? Well, um, there's been a lot, very large literature in social choice, um, so can we inventing impossibilities? Well, maybe, so if this is a mathematical fact, there's no way you can really disprove it, but you can maybe find some um, interesting restrictions so that it doesn't hold um, to the extent that uh, in the worst case. Say uh, we have the worst case impossibilities, and then there's a lot of work on the domain restrictions. For example, one in, um, famous domain restriction is single pick preferences. And assuming single pick preferences, you can prove many, um, many of these impossibly just go away, like arrows or uh, uh, given setwise or uh, many other things. Um, but one criticism is that um, single pick can single pick preferences, even though it is natural in some cases. It can be very restrictive, especially think about even a single voter's preferences is slightly changing in some way, then it just completely rule the uh, single pick mix. So um, you can take a look at uh, some of the recent paper by Lechner and Lechner, so Lechner Square. So 
Um, and then another big line of research has been focused on average case analysis. Mostly we are looking at the probability of for the impossibility to hold when P, uh, the preference profile, is randomly generated from some distribution. And usually the random the distribution is independent, identically distributed. And more, um, uh, more often it is um, run on uniform uh, distributions, also known as impartial, impartial culture. So an impartial culture has been very, uh, and received lots of criticisms as um, unrealistic. I'm sure there are many references, um, but um, we are not aware of a realistic model to make this uh, average case argument. So um, to quickly summarize, right, so there are many great results, but um, looks like sometimes the uh, assumption is not so realistic. So um, interestingly, computer scientists have gone through a similar path, uh, especially in the analysis of the runtime of algorithms. Say, um, if you think about the worst case runtime of the algorithm, you are thinking about the runtime when the input is generated from, uh, sorry, the input is chosen by an adversary, so you are taking the supremum. And this is the uh, uh, worst case is the idea behind MV hardness and bigger notation and other things. And computer scientists have looked at domain restrictions. For example, we know that three set is MV hard, but two set can be solved in problem over time, which is great, but not all of the instances are two set, actually only a very small amount of them are two sets. And similarly, average case complexity has been studied extensively. And here again, uh, we are drawing the input from um, and distribution and analyze the expected runtime. And then it has been criticized of being unrealistic. So what can we do? Well, um, fortunately, and more or less more recent um, discovery in computer science in, back in 2001, actually the journal paper was in 2004, is called a smooth complexity analysis. So it's kind of extended and combines idea of the worst case and the average case analysis to provide hopefully a more realistic model um, to, uh, for, uh, for uh, runtime analysis. And this work is gonna be looking at uh, how are we gonna do uh, smooth analysis for social choice, especially social choice properties, social choice and possibility theorems. And we are not aware well of a similar work before, so that's the main topic of this talk. Okay, so let's take a very quick um, look at the smooth complexity theory um, and what does it mean? So, um, Basically, it says that there's an adversary who can choose the, uh, the, the ground truth input to the algorithm, let's call it theta. And then nature is gonna add a noise so that the, um, the input to the algorithm is gonna be generated from some distribution pi. And then um, um, uh, the uh, input is generated and fed to the algorithm, and then you evaluate the expected runtime. So the second part here is completely just the same as the average case, but then there's adversary choosing which distribution you're gonna draw um, your uh, input from. So um, more mathematically, um, um, this is worst case by uh, the adversary, which is a supreme part, and then average case by nature, which is adding noise and then taking average given the worst case. Okay, so it's a pretty big discovery, mainly because it, uh, people believe that it provides a more realistic model to analyze um, the runtime of algorithm and go, and go beyond the worst case and average case. And that's the reason why it got, uh, uh, got a price back in 2008. Okay, so this is the smooth uh, uh, complexity. Now, um, the rest of the talk will be organized as follows. So we're going to ask two questions. So, how are we going to define smooth social choice? And second, is it interesting and a useful definition? Okay, so in this talk, we're going to focus on the properties that are called, we call per profile properties, not all properties. So, these type of properties can be described by a function that maps a voting rule R and a profile to uh, zero or one. Zero means that R does not satisfy X at this profile, and Y means that R satisfies X at this profile. In other words, then uh, overall, what we say R satisfy this property X, even only if you're taking the infimum uh, inf um, of, of all, all preference profiles, and then uh, you're looking at uh, this SX function, and if this equals to one, then it means that no adversary can choose and preference profile to violate uh, this property X, okay? So 
Many, actually many, um, but not all uh, properties in social choice can be represented this, this way. For example, uh, well, um, the one related to the Condorcet paradox, uh, let's call it S NCC, no Condorcet cycle. It doesn't depend on the, the uh, voting rule, right? So, um, so we, we don't have voting rule in the input. It equals to one if P count does not contain a Condorcet cycle. And similarly, you can uh, model the, uh, the avoidance of the ANR impossibility as uh, an per pro property uh, in some way that I'm not going to describe, but you can imagine how it works. Okay. All right. Now um, we can, based on these two things, we can define uh, smooth social choice, which is first we're going to have an per profile property X described by SX, for example, SNCC or S not ANR. And we're going to have a set of distributions of the votes for the adversary to choose from. So we're going to limit adversary's power because otherwise it becomes exactly a worst case analysis, which might be a good thing, but that's not that interesting and useful for us. So finally, we can just define the smooth satisfaction of R with respect to X to be almost the same as the smooth complexity, which is SX, but we're going to add a tilde on top of it, means that it's smoothed. So um, then uh, in this case, the adversary is trying to minimize the expected satisfaction of this axiom by choosing a distribution from the set of distributions D he is allowed to choose, and then nature is going to take average and, uh, and to generate a preference profile. Okay, so at the high level, this is how the framework works. And uh, we're going to make um, further assumptions that uh, in this talk um, to develop interesting results that we're going to assume that the distribution is a product distribution of, uh, uh, of pi, which is a set of distributions that the adversary can set for every vote, uh, voter um, independently, but not identically. So very quickly, we have um, multiple uh, voters and we have adversary who can choose the ground truths for each uh, voter independently. And then um, nature is going to add independent noise so that the distribution of every voter becomes pi 1, pi 2, pi 3 in this uh, capital pi. And then based on this distribution, we're going to generate uh, the preference profile and then we evaluate the uh, smooth satisfaction. Okay, so um, this is somewhat mild assumption because uh, the ground truth preferences theta here can be arbitrarily correlated but noises are independent. So which is standard assumption in, for example, um, discrete choice, uh, OLS, uh, logistic regression, and BLP or many other uh, literatures. So, and we're gonna further make some technical assumptions, which saying that this pi is uh, strictly positive. I mean, um, like any distribution in it is, uh, is larger than some uh, constant, positive constant and closed as a closed set in the probability syntax. So just a technical, but mild assumptions. Okay, so just give you some very quick example. Um, okay, so 10 minutes uh, after the talk, I'm giving examples. So um, we can model ordinal ground truth preferences. For example, we can use a Mallow's model to describe single agent Mallow's model to, to describe how every agent's preferences are generated. Say the adversary says that first guy, your true preference is one pair first to two. But and your um, your uh, dispersion parameter is 0.3. I'm not going to describe what it is, but it's just some parameters in the model. And then uh, nature is going to generate a preference pro, uh, pre a ranking based on this mouse model. And so, uh, similarly for the second guy and third guy to come up with the preference profile. And another example. Oh, uh, by the way, so uh, different voters can have different dispersion parameters. And uh, for an, as another example, um, um, the agent's preferences can be cardinal, like in you know, the random mutated model. So for example, here we use the single agent like Lewis, and then the adversary tells the first guy, your true preference is your true value for the first guy is 10, your true value for the second guy is seven, and then nature is gonna generate random preferences based on this black truth model and so on. And different people can have different um, ground truth preferences. Okay. So um, let's talk about, um, this is the definition, uh, hopefully it makes sense. And um, now the real question is that, uh, is it useful? I mean, we can define it arbitrarily we want, but hopefully I, I, I found it's pretty interesting that um, it, it is useful to some extent. Um, I'm gonna describe three results and appetizer um, counter to the paradox, which is a pretty lightweight application. 
and a slightly more complicated ANR impossibility, as we described earlier. And then uh, we can also use the main technical tools to describe the like to characterize likelihood of ties and answer some open questions and in a very more general sense. Okay, so um, suppose the conversation paradox. We actually provide a dichotomy. Um, so it holds for a general um, cases, say uh, very general uh, situations, for any fixed number of alternatives m, at least the three, for any strictly positive and closed pi, which is very mild, um, but I don't have time to um, uh, um, discuss it, and for any single sufficiently large m, the following two things hold. So either smoothed avoidance part hold, which says that Condorcet's paradox vanishes exponentially fast. So here I, I said there's a condition, which I'm going to very quickly describe it, but you just imagine that there's a condition somewhere for the smooth avoidance part to hold. And otherwise, there's a smooth paradox part to hold, which says that Condorcet's paradox does not vanish. So uh, the probability is not going to converge to one. Okay, so what is this condition? Um, very quickly, it just says that for every distribution in the convex hull, of the distribution pi, big distribution pi we had uh, for the adversary, the unweighted majority graph of this pi as a fraction profile has no weak condensate cycles. So, and if this holds, then uh, smooth avoidance part ha uh, happens, otherwise a smooth paradox part happens. And more uh, mathematically, um, um, this is how it works. So uh, all of the ties are symptotically, ba uh, uh, symptotically about, all of the bounds are symptotically tied. So this is the smoothest uh, avoid uh, no condensate cycle for this voting rule. Well, actually, we can remove this voting rule R, which is uh, um, converged to one exponentially fast. Otherwise, there's a small gap you're never able to uh, overcome. So the proof is actually um, um, pretty simple. You can you can do it with the standard techniques, but um, some part of the proofs uh, I, I didn't see how to. Do, I mean, in, in, in the, I didn't see it in the literature. Uh, especially some, uh, some part uh, over here. Uh, but anyway, so I'm going to show you very quickly uh, how to prove it using uh, a, a main technical theorem because that's going to be useful for all of the other results I'm going to talk about uh, later today and probably in other cases. So the high level idea of the proof is given a property X and given a distribution pi, for any preference profile P, we're going to first characterize this um, phenomenon, which is P satisfies X as um, the histogram of P in the union of multiple polyhedra. So what is histogram? Histogram is really just counting the multiplicity of every type of ranking. So it's a vector of n factorial uh, nature numbers. And in other words, this is known as a special case of the Poisson multinomial variable, which generates many fundamental mathematical um, uh, things. So and then we can, if this is the case, we can write down probability that P satisfies X when it's randomly generated from, um, the, uh, uh, from pi as uh, two sides. So certainly it's larger or uh, equal to than the max of the probability that the histogram will be in each of the three uh, polyhedras, polyhedra. And then it is small upper bounded by the total uh, sum of them. It's just a unit back, right? Then we're going to prove a main technical theorem, which is a dichotomy theorem on the smoothest probability for Poisson multinomial variable to be in a polyhedron. Okay, so uh, let me show you a quick example of how does it work for condensate cycles. So uh, to prove the uh, condensate part. So uh, suppose we have three alternatives, and given any preference profile, um, let's say X here is the property that there is a condensate cycle, not like in previously we studied the property that X represents there's no condensate cycle. So, and then we're gonna use um, uh, X vector to represent the histogram of P. And you can very easily see that P has a condensate cycle one to two to three back to one, if and only if the following um, linear uh, inequality is uh, satisfied. So basically the first one says that um, there's an edge from one to two, the second says that there's an edge from two to three, and the third one says there's an edge from three to one. Okay, and you can equivalent to written down it as M polyhedra, which is a uh, some integer matri matrix multiplied transpose of the vector of uh, six uh, numbers and smaller or equal to than some number B, which uh, in general doesn't have to be an integer or positive. 
And then if you let H123 to denote this polyhedra of uh, solutions of this, uh, this set of linear inequalities, and you define H, H3 to one uh, similarly, you can very easily see that the probability that P has a condensate cycle is exactly the same as the probability that the histogram is either in one to three or three to one, right? So either it has a condensate cycle of one to three or it has some condensate cycle of three to one, okay? So this is a high level idea. And now let me spend um, just very quickly, um, uh, hopefully one minute to describe the, the uh, main technical theorem because uh, I think it's uh, pretty interesting and useful. Um, it basically says that that probability, smooth probability, is, I think it's called a trichotomy. It's either zero if, so for example, this is a polyhedron H we're interested in. It doesn't have any integer solution of size n. Of course, there's no way uh, x can be in it. Um, and otherwise, if um, here is something called h less than or equal to n zero intersects with the, the convex hull of the pi we are chosen from. So, for example, here h less than or equal to n zero is basically just to remove. Okay, sorry. Uh, this is typo here. It should be zero. Remove uh, replace b by zero, and then if these two things intersect, then uh, it's going to uh, does not intersect. Um, uh, then uh, this exponential case. Otherwise, the probability is going to be a polynomial, but the slightly non-trivial part is that uh, it's asymptotic particle tied um, to the degree of the dimension of this h less than than zero uh, divided by two. So this is actually the hardest part, and you can see this is the polynomial case because a convex hull intersect with uh, h less than than zero. And um, uh, the proof, very high level proof idea is that, I mean, the existing condensate, uh, sorry, um, um, uh, central limit theorem is too coarse. So we have to develop, I mean, pretty nasty uh, anti concentration bounds and concentration bounds for PNVs. And then we use V representation and some sensitive analysis and a lot of things happening. Um, hopefully, I didn't make, make a mistake in the proofs. Um, so then uh, I hope that this can be proved. Okay. Um, I know I'm, uh, I'm almost running out of time, so let me just uh, thank you, Bill. Um, just one minute to describe this uh, main dish and one minute to describe the dessert. So um, basically, I'm just going to skip through it, unfortunately. So um, and anyway, again, we have a dichotomy theorem for the smoothed ANR, which says that smooth is pretty positive news because it says that under very natural conditions, there exists an anonymous resolute rule, R A anonymous, and another uh, a neutral resolute rule, R neutral, so that the smooth probability for A and R to disappear, either um, it's, it's one according to Mullen's condition, and if Mullen's condition doesn't hold, then if some other conditions hold, it, it, it converges exponentially fast to one, which is great news. Otherwise, it converts polynomially fast to one, which is great news. So in other words, uh, we pretty much always have the smooth possibility part, which basically says that in practice, if you're going to use R anonymous or R neutral, um, then uh, ANR may not be a very big concern. And the smooth the impossibility is a very mild impossibility, which says that no resolute rule can do better than this bound. So these are tight bounds for all resolute rules. And of course, you can ask, well, I'm not going to use R anon or R neutral because I have my favorite rule, position scoring rule to use in my mind. Then we actually can provide a new easy to compute tie breaking mechanism together with whatever anonymous and neutral correspondence or irresolute use you want. You can make it to a, a pretty good, good to uh, almost match uh, the, the best bound over here. And it's actually better than uh, the existing, strictly better than existing maximal graphic or fixed agent tie breaking which is back to the satisfaction of both anonymity and neutrality. So I'd rather talk offline, but I have to move on. Um, and uh, the last quick result I'm going to uh, very briefly talk about is the smooth likelihood of the ties, because um, there is, seems to be a general um, uh, perception that in large elections, ties are rare. And it's very closely related to the argument that a single voter has negligible influence, like have very limited uh, voting power. And this is um, being described by Condorcet, by Hegel, and by many, many, many other guys. But we are not able to find a rigorous mathematical um, um, argument um, to justify this fact for, uh, very un for very realistic models. And actually, so uh, there are lots of work, but most of them focus on two candidates or multiple candidates under the plurality and the border rule. 
And actually, there is open question back in 2001, like asymptotically, what is the likelihood of k-way ties? We're not just interested in two-way ties, but three-way ties, four-way ties, beyond plurality border under the impartial culture assumption. So, and we, we, we can use the techniques um, pro, pro, uh, provided earlier to do a um, smooth analysis and as a proposition uh, and corollary restricted to IC, um, the original theorem is stronger, we are able to characterize um, the uh, smooth, actually just the likelihood of ties under IC for any K-way ties um, beyond for a very large um, a range of voting rules, for example, same scores, STV and other things. And this result is roughly ordered in the increasing order. So like ties happens more often. Okay, so I'm gonna show you the result um, that um, I think that probably the most interesting case are ranked pairs um, because it's uh, uh, the exponent is uh, some, something that's pretty interesting is related to log k. And also the Copeland alpha, which actually have complete characterization for all of alpha. And sometimes it's related to L alpha, which is minimal integer such that alpha multiplied by L alpha is integer. So, um, I mean, the full description in the paper, but okay, the, the last slides. Um, in this talk, uh, we are talking about some ideas of, uh, of leveraging smooth analysis to social choice to hopefully provide a more realistic analysis. And we were able to got, get some smooth possibility result for Condorcet's paradox and A and R. I think the nice things about it is that we draw a clear line behind uh, between um, possibility and impossibility under the realistic model. And we look at smooth ties and we provide it and technical tool to maybe um, analyze other interesting properties. Well, for future work, I mean, uh, there are really just so many of them. <laughs> um, pretty much everything you can think about it in the smooth analysis framework. It just a strictly generalizes IID distributions, especially IC, and it's been deemed um, realistic by computer scientists. So maybe that's something that social choice researchers can think about, including axioms, impossible theorems, other problems, I mean, your favorite problems, and also competition social choice as uh, Doro, Tobias, and uh, York uh, just recently discussed in an uh, Alice Bell paper. Okay, so with that, thank you so much for your attention, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Laurent. Let's unmute and give Laurent a round of applause. I see a question from Alexander Karpov in the uh, chat box. Alexander, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Okay, so can you say something about variable n? So, for example, the number of voters can has a Poisson distribution with some parameter. So, in your result, you, you have uh, always for sufficiently large n. Can we have a result without sufficiently large n in general? Yeah, yeah, so great. So, um, a couple of works I am aware of that they are looking at Poisson um, games. So, for example, even Myers has Poisson games. So, um, yeah, so this result, uh, so all of these are symptotic results. And um, the technical description is that there exists a constant capital N so that uh, all of these codes for every capital N, uh, every small N that is uh, larger than this capital N. So, we don't, do not assume M distribution. I mean, um, I do see these two settings are somewhat incomparable, but I feel that our setting is slightly stronger, I would say. So maybe it's interesting to think about how to generalize it to also with distributions. Does it answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, Rishef has a, a, a comment. Rishef, you want to make your comment? Okay, let me look at chat. Oh, okay, so. Yeah, yeah it's like a co comment slash question, so. Uh, uh -huh. It looks like the argument is that although you know we can always like construct like carefully construct um, an instance with ties, like in general, if there is some noise, then there will be no ties. And it looks like some similar argument is used um, in this approximal uh, stat uh, approximate mm -hmm. strategy proofness, which is actually approximate uh, indifference. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the other pass is, is one example for using that. So uh, it looks like, I know, different ways to argue that you can add uh, mm -hmm. noise in some smart way so that you know, the probability of a tie or, or uh, uh, being uh, influential will be yeah. negligible. Yeah, yeah, so certainly it's related to um, many things actually. So uh, yeah, I'm aware of the paper you uh, mentioned. Um, so. I think what um, one big difference over there is, so 
um, yeah, I, if I have time, I would like to discuss the, dis, uh, the difference between this work and previous work. So um, I think the previous uh, papers, I, 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 so first, uh, um, this notion itself is probably not that, not that novel because um, the worst average case analysis is a very standard in frequentist um, statistics. So I won't be surprised if there's some previous work that works on similar things. So, um, but I think that work, uh, I don't remember they are doing similar analysis. Uh, so I think our result might be slightly more general because we consider any uh, set of distributions. It's not like specific ways of that. Uh, um, noise. So yeah, so I mean, adding noise to uh, those is uh, it's it's not an uh, new idea. Yes, I'm not sure I answer your question, but uh, uh, technically, I think there are some differences. Okay, um, I think we'll have to make this next one the last one. Uh, Errol Siegel Halevi has a comment on a related paper in fair division. Did you want to mention that, Errol? No, no, just because you mentioned in the in the last slide that uh, mm -hmm. most uh, most analysis has uh, implications for field allocation. So it's interesting that recent, very recently it started to show up. Yeah, yeah great, great. Thanks so much. I, I just looked at it and it looks pretty interesting. So uh, yes. yeah, so um, I think yeah, I'm aware of a few other um, things. So I mean, so. Um, yeah, so I mean, yeah, it's a, it's most analysis has already been applied to many things, including, um, I think, the uh, determinant of a random generated matrices and many, many, many other things. So yeah, that's great to see this paper. Um, personally, I do think resource allocation, there are many we can think about. For, for example, there's still the big open question of EFX. So what is most likelihood that EFX is going to happen? What is most likelihood of many other things? So it's slightly different from uh, what they consider here, which is more like a numerical property, but I mean, so for other fundamental properties, per profile properties, I think um, some of the techniques that developed in our papers might be useful. So yeah, so they're, they're, it's, it's definitely very interesting. Uh, thanks so much uh, for the reference. Okay. Okay, folks, uh, let's unmute and uh, give a round of applause to both the speakers. <laughs> Vincent has an announcement about what's coming up in the next two weeks of the seminar. Vincent, you want to yes. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. So uh, next week we won't have a seminar. We'll meet. We'll meet again only on the 29th of October, and we will have two great speakers. We will have Anna Bogomolnaya, who will speak about fair division, and we will have Jean-François Lallier, who will speak about something mysterious. I'm just reading the title: Evolutionary Foundation. On, of the universalization ethics with political application. So that sounds scary before the hero Halloween, just before Halloween, <laughs> we'll have something very mysterious and scary, I hope, maybe. <laughs> See you in two weeks from now. Okay, goodbye everyone. Bye.